What I entitled the uh, the sermon for today is, Are There Few Who Are Saved? Okay, so question, a question that I, uh, that I would like to ask everybody. Can a good person who isn't of your religion or faith, can they attain salvation or go to heaven? Now, let me, let me kind of uh, elaborate a little bit on this. Obviously, we as Christians, we have what we believe in. We believe that the only way to heaven to attain salvation is through the blood of Jesus. That means repentance, accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and following his commandments. Okay, everyone agree on that. That is our faith and that is what we believe in. Okay, so can a good person, whether they're not what they, they don't necessarily believe in what you believe, uh, whether they're another religion, whether they're, you know, uh, outside or some other doctrine or something like that, even though, but if they're good people, you know, they don't do things, they don't commit uh, sin, they don't steal, they don't commit adultery, they don't fornicate, they don't, they, you know, they don't kill and stuff like that, and they're good people. They, they probably even go to church and they give their tithes and offerings. Can peep, but they don't believe in what you believe. Can they attain salvation? So how many people think that they will go to heaven? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you think that they will attain salvation. Okay, okay. Well, actually, there was a, a poll actually done by, it was a secular poll, but it was done by Newsweek. And they asked Americans all over the United States, what they believed and what they practiced and what their faith was. And among the questions was the one I just asked. Can a person who isn't of your religious faith go to heaven or attain salvation? And here was its response. Uh, evangelical Protestants, 68% of people, of evangelical, uh, evangelical Protestants said that yes, good people, even if they don't believe what we believe, will go to heaven. Uh, the next uh, category was evangelical and Pentecostals. Uh, so this is kind of uh, the majority of what we think of uh, the Christian, you know, Christian churches around what they believed in. 83%, 83% believe and said, even though they don't necessarily believe in what we believe and have faith in what we have uh, our faith in, they believe that as long as they are good people, they will go to heaven. Okay, Catholics, 91% said that uh, if they don't believe in what they believe, they will go to heaven. Okay, so we got, uh, and then the last category, they just asked non-Christians, people that are not believers. And there was only 73%, which is interesting, 73% said that they, they, would, they would go to heaven, even though they don't believe in whatever they believe. So in total, there was about 80% in general. People believe, if you do not believe in their faith necessarily, that they would still attain salvation. Now, where am I going with this? So the response is interesting, especially amongst evangelicals and Pentecostals. Uh, most people believe, I mean, most people believe in different faiths. And they believe that mo and most people in today's society, in today's teaching, in today's doctrine, that most people will attain salvation. Now, I would like to suggest that the way that we are taught in scripture is very different. Jesus was asked a similar question in Luke 13, 23, and spoke often of this subject, who will be saved? And note, this is what Jesus taught. He said, few will be saved. Many think most will be saved, or put it in another way, most believe that other, most people will go to heaven. Uh, but when we look at scripture, Jesus taught that few would be saved. And like I said, let's go to Luke 13, 23, Luke uh, chapter 13, verse 23 and 24. And I'll read it. And it says, then one said to him, Lord, are they few who are saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter 
and will not be able. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks and we glorify your name for this wonderful, glorious opportunity to be in your presence. We ask, Father God, for enlightenment into your scripture that we may learn, Father God, and that we may understand that through your Holy Spirit that you give us revelation, that we may grow, Father God, in spirit, grow in knowledge, that we may make the correct decisions, Father, for we know that you are the salvation and that you are life and that you are the only way. In Jesus' name, we love you and we give you praise. And in Jesus' name, we say, amen. Okay, so like I said, it was interesting when I was kind of looking at this and then I was kind of looking at these different uh, surveys and stuff like that because today in today's age, uh, the, the new uh, age doctrine, uh, this modern uh, doctrine today is that we tend to believe, of course, the, the basis of this is because of, you know, we are living under grace, uh, Jesus' love, all loving all merciful and 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 this is kind of uh where i think that today has become very confusing and even decept deceitful to the christian church is that we believe that faith and and and, and our salvation is once we accept the lord or or we don't even do that as long as we're good and as long as we you know we're good to our neighbor and we practice you know a good life that we will attain salvation but this is not what has been taught to us in scripture like if if we just go for instance we go to the old testament only eight people were saved during the flood in genesis 7 23 it says so he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground both man and cattle creeping thing and birds of the air they were destroyed from earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. So right there, a lot of times we mirror uh, the flood, the time of Noah to, to the end of days, which I believe that we are getting very close to the end of days. So only eight people were saved during this time. Only three souls escaped from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Everyone knows the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Okay, so obviously this is kind of, kind of like what we're living in today because uh, the people, uh, 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 the the Hebrew people were living in Sodom and Gomorrah, but this is such a corrupt city, full of sin, kind of how we're living today. If you look around us, I mean, today the way we live and what we are exposed to from every means from from social media to tv to everything there is so much corruption and so much deception that the that satan and the world has has pretty much put upon us and upon our families and upon our children it, it is like we are living in sodom and gomorrah you know and it says in genesis 19 24 through 30 the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heavens. So he overthrew the cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and that and what grew on the ground. So God utterly destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. His wrath fell upon this, this, uh, these cities because of the corruption, just like at the end of days. One of the things I always uh, thought... Uh, I always think like you know there's so much evil going on so much evil today so much corruption so much violence and you know all these things are 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 destroying us destroying the world destroying uh, humanity and all these things are done by people and by and by uh the sin and by the and by satan but when it really comes to it to the end of the days at the end of days the wrath of god is what really is going to destroy everything Kind of like what Noah's time witnessed. They witnessed the wrath of God. Sodom and, Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah witnessed the wrath of God. That is something that we are getting close to. And that is something that we have to be mindful, have to be kind of awake to see the deception that is falling upon us today. One more example that I was reading is that only two men out of the 640, 550,000 over the age of 20 were permitted into the land of Canaan. Now, this is the story of when 
the, uh, the uh, Israel uh, came out of Egypt, right? And uh, they were in the wilderness for 40, 40 years. But it says, well, let me just read it. In Numbers 14, 26 through 32, it says, The uh, carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in the wilderness. So these are the people, pretty much everybody that was in the wilderness that came out of Egypt. And all of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell. So the promised land is almost representing kind of like, you know, the, the place that they were getting to, almost like a heaven, right? And only two people out of everybody that left Egypt were allowed to enter into the promised land. So what am I trying to what, what am I trying to get at? What I'm trying to say is that today we have been taught so much whether we believe it or not, but it's still in the back of our minds that most people, most good people will reach heaven will reach the presence of God. <laughs> I was talking, I was talking to my dad, the pastor, and he was telling me a story that when he was younger, and obviously they were Catholic, but he was telling that he was telling his, his mom, my grandma, he was like, uh, should I say in Sp uh, Spanish, mama, you know, no, no, uh, uh, he was, <laughs> mama, <laughs> no, he was telling, he was asking his mom, how many how many people, uh, or who do you think will uh, go to heaven and who people, you know, who won't? And then uh, my grandma was telling him, no, I mean, uh, or he asked who won't go to heaven. That's what he was saying. And he, and then uh, my dad was saying, is it maybe those people that live over there that, that you know, that, that don't, you know. And she was like, no, no, mijo, those people are pretty good. You know, they might do things here and there, but they're good people. They're going to go to heaven. And then, and then, uh. He asked about some other people that live in the other town or whatever. No, no, those people, ah, they, they, they're, they're good people, you know. I mean, they, they, every once in a while, maybe they get drunk and stuff like that. But of, other than that, they're pretty good people. They're going to go to heaven. And then so my dad was like, so who will, you know, who is not going to go to heaven? And then my grandma was like, well, you know that one guy that lives way on the other side of town and, you know, did this and that, that guy that guy probably won't make it so so then uh, so the pastor my dad was saying so you're trying to tell me about all these hundreds of people that i know that only this one person's not going to make it and she was like yes absolutely and 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 so so it was kind of kind of something that we as people as humanity we don't like to think we kind of are kind of we like to to be optimistic when it comes to this right we want everybody to go to heaven. And believe me, God our Father wants everyone to go to heaven as well. He wants his creation to be saved. In fact, he did everything possible for us to be saved. He gave his life. He, he shed his blood on Calvary. For, so all we have to do is make the decision and accept, accept what he has done. He paid the price. So, but this is something that I think that we have be, uh, come to believe and I think it's more of the society, and I think it's growing more and more today, that we believe that everybody's going to go to heaven. Most of everyone's going to go to heaven. Most good people are going to go to heaven. But sadly to say that Jesus has taught time and time again that there is a wide gate and there is a narrow gate. Why is he saying this? If this is what we are kind of taught sometimes, and, and this is kind of what we believe, how is this possible? How is it possible that most people are going to make it to heaven, yet God talks about a narrow gate? You know, is, is, is he going to squeeze everybody into this narrow gate? No, absolutely not. I think it's just something that we have been deceived, something that we have been taught through generation, and it's kind of just something that, that, that it's kind of just like natural. We want to believe this. And I'm going to tell you, that through the Old Testament and the New Testament and, 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 and even Jesus Christ himself have taught us quite the opposite, that we should be mindful, that we, that we should be practicing our faith every day because this is, this is real, this is reality. This is not something that, 
uh, we see through an, uh, throughout history that there has been utterly destruction upon the world, upon people, and they have lost their lives, you know, and they have lost their salvation because they don't believe. And today is no exception. Now, Jesus is the only way. How many raise your hand and know that Jesus is the only way? Through the blood of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, uh, Jesus taught that no one could come to the Father through him. In, in uh, John 14, 6, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Through me, Amen. So, being religious is not enough. Being Christian sometimes is even not enough. And when I say Christian, I mean a lot of times we can come and we can come to church. I mean, there's times we, we can have ministries. We can be I've seen pastors and youth pastors and praise and worship leaders and people that lead uh, these huge concerts and stuff like that. People that, that speak in his name and prophesy in his name. That is not necessarily what, make, what, lets, what gets you in to the, to the narrow gates into heaven. Yes, first of all, we know that we must accept the Lord Jesus as our personal Savior repent of our sins and then we have to follow his commandments we have to continue to practice our faith every day that's why i always say carry your cross every day because it's not just that one time that a lot of people believe see i, I i've heard from many people and i've i've experienced from uh uh even brothers and sisters uh, they don't go here of course but you know in other churches you know and uh they're they're like well you know i am christian you know, and they're just like, okay, uh, but you know, are are you? Do you still, you know, do you believe that you're going to heaven? Yeah, yeah. But I know these people, and I kind of know what they do. And you can kind of judge someone by their fruits. And I was like, but you know, if you keep doing this, man, like you're not, you know, you, you can't be doing this. You can't be practicing this, you know, because it's not going to go well. No, I already, I go to church, you know, I, you know, you know what? I'm even, in the, I'm not even going to join the choir. And I was like, whoa, okay, well, that's good, man. That's a good. That's a step in the right direction. He goes, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join the choir and this and that. Uh, he's like, I'm even dating a girl that's in the choir and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, awesome, you know. But that's not what, what allows you to, to make it to heaven, you know. You have to practice. You have to change your ways, you know. See, people today have been led to believe that once you make that, that decision, which is, of course, the most of important decision in your life that you are set that that's it that you make the decision and now i'm free i can i can do whatever i want i'm christian now you know and i can go about about my life and i can pretty much do everything as one as long as i don't kill and i don't really steal and i don't do all these things but that's not necessarily what jesus was saying he was saying that there are very few that are going to make it that means that we have to we have to take our salvation and put it in a, in, in, a, in a position that is so important. It's like a treasure. We can't take it for granted. It's not something that we can just take lightly. This is the most important thing in your life. We are only here for a short time. What is really going to uh, matter is what we do for the rest of eternity. And I, I do believe that in today's age that we take our salvation and most people in most christians evangelicals as we could see by just a survey they believe and they have been deceived that once they accept christ or in some way or they're they're good or they do good works or they do missionary or whatever or they're humanitarians that that's it that, that they're they're on their way you know they're they're uh, and that's not true and that, that it's it's sad because most people will go their lives thinking that they're a Christian or they're saved and that's and they're not because they are not following his commandments they're not carrying their cross every day and that is something that I want us to to kind of understand I know most of us understand that and I, I know that most of us know that we have to 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 work on our faith and work on, on our lives and our and keep our salvation every day but I do think it's something important that we should constantly constantly be reminded of all of us amen 
Okay, so for those who obey, many think that all who believe in Jesus will be saved, that we are saved by faith only with no need of obedience. And that's what I was saying, like this modern doctrine today. Yet Jesus warned those who believed in him, uh, him but were lost. Uh, in Matthew 7, 21 to 20, uh, 23, uh, says, and I've read this before, but this is a, a powerful uh, a couple of verses. Matthew 7, 21 and 23. And listen to this. This is important. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, and when he's saying on that day, when we're uh, being judged, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name and then i will declare to them i never knew me i never knew you depart from me you who practice lawlessness so what is what is the lord trying to say right here he is saying that many on that day of judgment are going to come to him and say father but i was i was a pastor of this huge church I was preaching your name and, you know, I was doing miracles and, you know, I was casting out demons and I was doing prophecies and, or I was, I was this huge praise and worship leader and I had all these albums and, 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 and I had this podcast on YouTube and, 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 and I was doing your will. And he's going to say, I don't, uh, I don't know you. You were practicing lawlessness because people sometimes we get caught up in the things of the world and, and and sometimes we get caught up even in our ministries and stuff like that and we forget that every day we need to practice our faith we need to practice that we need to follow his commandments it's and you know because i've seen it many times and we've probably even experienced ourselves we can be in a ministry we can be in the choir you know we can be teaching a cell group and stuff like that and yet you know to everybody else everything looks fine and dandy right but we know our hearts and we know ourselves and we know well you know maybe I, sh I shouldn't be you know doing this or maybe i shouldn't be watching these things or kind of going this route or maybe i have something in my heart and 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 we can still continue our normal lives we can continue preaching i mean we've seen it today and we, it's such a tragedy but we've seen many pastor big pastors today and even people through throughout the bible too uh that are uh doing these great things and yet all of a sudden boom you see uh the tragedy you see like some kind of scandal or some kind of uh maybe uh you know I, you see it all the time probably one of the the biggest ones is usually like a, a, a pastor uh, committing, you know, uh, adultery or something like that, you know, and it's tragic. And I know we're human. We all make mistakes. The problem is, is that we have to continually monitor ourselves because the devil is out there trying to destroy us. He's always trying to tempt us, especially you as ministers, especially you as a chosen people that God has already taken, taken away from sin and, and taken into his kingdom. But the devil is going to be constantly, constantly, the world is going to be constantly trying to deceive you with things here and things there, you know? And that is what I'm trying to tell you today, to be protective of, especially you guys, especially the younger, all of you guys, but all of you are very young, all of you. All right? We're all, you know, pretty much, everyone in here is pretty much, you know, young. everyone's under 50. So if you're under 50 here, you're, we're, we're, all, we're all pretty young. Right, Juan? <laughs> so so it is something that i do believe that we have to protect like i said it's like a treasure okay so revelation 22 14 says blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates into the city so we have to remember not it's not just that one time in follow and believing in christ but we have to do it constant because there's many people that i've seen that have accepted the lord as their savior and yet today 
they're not here anymore. They're doing something else. They might still be preaching or still doing other things, but you know by their fruits that they're not practicing uh, what they're supposed to be practicing. A lot of times, why? Do they know what they're doing is wrong? I don't know. I, I don't know their heart. Maybe they're deceived. Maybe they do think that they're doing everything right. And that is what I'm trying to say. Do not be deceived. We have to wake up. And I do think that today, uh, I don't know. I, I, I Sometimes I look through uh, different, um, you know, like reading and, and, and just, just the way that the world is today. And I do think that there has been a great awakening in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. That I do think that, that Christianity has been waking up to the deception of the devil because I, I, I feel getting closer and closer to the end of times, which I do believe, I, I you know, and this is, of course, what I believe, but, you know, since Jesus' time to now, it's been around 2,000 years, and then before that, it's about 4,000 years. So I do believe that we are getting pretty much close to the end of the 6,000 years, and that is the end of times because I do believe that on that first day, of the 7,000 year, that's the millennium reign. That's when we're going to be, uh, you know, having a big party in heaven with, with God, right? So I do think that we are getting very, very close to the end of times, which is going to rep represent, it's going to be like at the times of Noah. It's going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's what we're experiencing. It's like, I mean, today, uh, and, you know, we're parents, me uh, and the, the ones that have kids here, uh, we, we've been looking at different, like, things for like cartoons and stuff like that and things are so twisted and so corrupted today I mean, we pretty much have to screen everything and, and and it's weird because i don't know if it was always i don't think it was always like that you know but i remember when i was younger yeah you know that i used to watch cartoons like you know he-man thundercats and stuff like that and they had their stuff but you know but but today i do feel like in the last what like five years or so or that 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 these cartoons and, and these are cartoons for like kids and stuff and, and I'm not even getting to like movies and stuff like that that's without question but I do believe that there has been a, such a huge indoctrination upon our youth upon you guys upon our kids and, and it's just really really just trying to push that corruption trying to push that deception and trying to twist our minds and twist the minds of our kids and our and our and our teenagers and our and our church to try to pull them away from the light and try to still make them think you're fine it's okay you can keep going to church you can still stay in your ministry but you don't have to do everything exactly you can still do these things over here and you're going to be okay and that is the deception see i always i always said if the world and Satan would come against us like kind of like a persecution in some ways I feel like that would be better because we would see our enemy coming and we could fight but unfortunately that's not what hap what's happening see the enemy is coming within it's coming in within kind of like and we don't even know what's what's happening until it's too late like the analogy I think I said one time with the, the frog boiling, right? You know, it's like if you turn it up slowly, the frog will just boil to death, right? And opposed to if you just throw him in a, in, a, in a pot of hot water, he's going to jump out. See, I think that little by little, Satan and the world have been deceiving, kind of turning up the heat and coming in within the church, coming within our young people. And that is the deception and that's the corruption. And that is something that we have to be constantly awake. Remember, Jesus said only few will enter. That's why we have to be mindful and we have to be constant about what we're doing. Amen. Okay, so uh, believing that many will be saved, believe me, it is a, how could I say, a comforting doctrine today believing that everybody is going to be together in heaven it's it's very popular actually doctrine you know i mean uh, most of the churches today the real big churches i mean that's what they preach and their main emphasis of this is that jesus is all loving and is all merciful and i agree jesus is all loving jesus is all merciful but i i do believe that we have been uh 
our definition of all loving and, and being all merciful is very different from I be, where, where I believe God is. And this is where I think this is where the mistake is. See, when we, when people confront me and say, uh, you know, Jesus is all loving, Jesus is all, you know, merciful, why is he going to let everybody, why is he going to let people be destroyed, uh, go into be destroyed in hell? You know, why would he do that? He's all loving and all merciful. But I was like, yes, but also God is a God of order and he is just. And I think that's what the part that they're leaving out. Because how many believe that that God is that the God that we serve, the King of Kings, is the same yesterday, today, and forever? How many believe that? Everyone, we believe that, right? And so sometimes, and when I tell, you know, I ask this question, you know, usually they say the same thing. Yes, you know, God doesn't change. We all know that God doesn't change. He doesn't change anything, you know? So how is it that that God in the Old Testament, you look in the Old Testament, and this used to trip me up a lot. I remember uh, when I was a little, uh, you know, younger, and I used to read the Old Testament, and it was like God, and he would go into, uh, tell the, the, the Hebrew people, go and uh, destroy the, the, you know, kill all the women and children and cattle and everything and destroy them, and, uh, you know, and I always thought like, man, you know, that's, and then I compare, you know, then I think of Jesus, you know, the Christ, and then, you know, he's, you know, kind and he, you know, eating with, uh, you know, the, the sinners and stuff like that. And it's like, are these the same people, you know, almost like, but it is. And, and the thing that I realized is that God in the Old Testament, he was doing that out of love and out of mercy. Why? And this is something, of course, we could get into, but I, it's because the whole reason was for us to get to Christ, for him to pay the price because if not then we're all we're all lost we were all lost it wasn't until god paid the price the reason was to keep the bloodline pure for jesus to come if that wouldn't happen then we wouldn't have a chance so he did this out of an act of mercy and out of love a lot of times i do believe that we think of love and mercy but we have a twisted way of thinking of thinking of it it's kind of like having kids i love my kids you know and i have mercy on my kids you know sometimes i don't give them spankings and stuff like that okay but imagine if, if we were to think the way people want god to be is like you know son i love you i'm all loving and i'm all merciful so pretty much you can do whatever you want you know so they go over there, they can break something, they can go over here and do this and that. And I was like, oh, I, but I'm all loving, I'm merciful, I can't really do anything, you know, just give me a hug, you know. And, and it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that with God either. God is a just God. And, you know, so we have to understand that, yes, he paid the ultimate price for us. He paid the price. And what we now need to do is take it and to follow his commandments. That is what we do. Obey, obedience, obedience is so important. And it's something that we must practice each day. So, for I want y'all to leave today, if anything, just leave with this, that few will be saved, and this is a fact, only few will be saved, but Jesus is the only way. Repentance and accepting him as, as, as your Lord and Savior and following his commandments, and amen. And if we do these things, we will be the ones that are entering into those narrow gates. Praise God. I mean, like I said before, of course, God wants everybody to reach the presence of God. He paid the price. He did his part. Now it's time for us to do our part. I'm going to read this last verse. It says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to to the knowledge of the truth for there is one god and one mediator between god and men the man christ jesus who gave himself as ransom for all to be testified in due time so remember we must be diligent we must be awake for i do believe that satan has deceived us and has in the world has deceived us more and more each day as we get closer and closer to the end um, so to finish up in conclusion we're pretty much out of time you know that there's over 
And this is kind of what I put, but there's over 200 religions in the world. And actually, believe it or not, there's like 4,000 branches of uh, Christianity, you know, different denominations. Uh, sometimes people ask me, what denomination are y'all? So they ever ask you this, and this is what I, I usually say. It was like, well, we're not a denomination, you know, this and that. Yeah, I know, but, you know, what, what do y'all fall un under, you know? And that's like, well, um, well, what were the disciples? And they're, and they're like, oh, they didn't have any. Well, that's whatever they were, that's what I am, you know? All right, we're Christian. That's it, you know? We're Christian. Uh, because I do think that even, even denominations is another way that the, we've been deceived into kind of dividing us into making us think in so many ways. But like I said, there's 4,000 branches of Christianity. But when Jesus comes back, there will be only two groups. And I'll leave you with this. Those who worship the beast and receive its mark and those who keep the commandments of God and have faith, and God will put his mark upon you. The faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, that is what's gonna count. So remember, be mindful, be ready, be awake, and remember that Jesus is coming soon. He paid the ultimate price. And in order for us to enter into those narrow gates, we have to accept him, carry our cross and follow his commandments each day let us pray father creator of all things king of kings and lord of lords we give you praise and we worship your mighty name we thank you father god for the the privilege it is to be able to to read your scripture father god to to read your words for we know that you are the word father we ask that you uh, give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Father God, that we may not be deceived, Father God, from the, uh, to, from the world and from Satan, that we may be able to make good judgment, that we may be able to, to protect each other, brothers and sisters, that on that day of judgment, we may be able to go into your heavenly kingdom and worship you for eternity. We ask, Father, to give us strength, Father God, for your Holy Spirit to guide us, that each day that we may carry our cross with joy and with happiness and that we may protect each other and we always to be under your covering. In Jesus' name, we love you, we worship you, and we give you praise and we give you thanks. And in Jesus' name we say, amen.